Okay. I figured out your game. You guys, you guys in the live chat like to hit it right at five on the dot because you think that's the first person I'm going to see and shout out. But I actually go back to the beginning of the chat because I'm because I'm from the old school. So let me say hello to Drew Hickman. Roger is here, MD. John Luca Barletta, Ciao Belly. Uh, Ciao Bella? I don't know. Dave Wilson's here, Tenzin. Uh, got Jonathan from Uruguay, very cool. Cliff is in the house. Uh, all, the, all the regulars are here. Rachel, uh, we miss you guys when we're not on the show, believe me. Okay, uh, it's, a, it's a packed show. I want to tell you very quickly about something that we're doing for all of you in California. So on April 30th, which is a Tuesday, after work, we're coming and we're going to do a live recording of the Compound and Friends. We're going to have multiple special guests. We're going to have drinks, food, music. It's going to be indoor, outdoor. It's going to be so much fun. Somebody told me LA doesn't really have great networking events, at least on a regular basis for investors. This is for you. If you're into trading, investing, stocks, bonds, if you work in wealth management, if you're just an individual investor, whatever your bag is, we want to meet you. We want to see you there. And you should meet some of your peers in the community. So there's a link to find out how you can get your ticket in the description. It'll be first come, first serve. Uh, it's going to be off the chain. And we can't wait to meet you. That's at the end of this month, Tuesday, April 30th. Michael, who's our sponsor tonight? Swire Charts. Okay, tell me more. Uh, all right, Josh, I have a question for you. Why Charts just released the results of their latest advisor communication survey. Mm. What percentage of survey respondents do you think considered switching financial advisors in 2023? Guess. Maybe, maybe like uh, half? Um, no, you know that's way too high. Come on. 75%. But honestly, I love Why when Charts. I hate surveys. I was, I was surprised by that. Come on, it's, it's like the, that's the end. Of, did they only poll people that switch that consider switching their advisors? All right, listen, be that a lot as, of people. <laughs> listen, be that as it may, what what uh, I guess one of the reasons why people might lose their clients is because they don't communicate well. And I'm here to yeah. tell you that Y charts is critical, vital, vital to client communication at our firm. Use it all the time. Can't do it without yeah, it. We do. We do. All our debts. All, all right. Uh, there's a there's an offer for professionals who want to see YCharts tools for proposals, report builder, scenario tool, et cetera, a 20% off initial uh, subscription if you tell them what are your thoughts sent you. Use the link in the notes below. All right, uh, look, man, we, uh, we're getting this like, everyone said, oh, we're due. We're due for a pullback. We need to cool off, blah, blah, blah. Well, here you go. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to assume this gets 80% worse or are you taking advantage of it? Uh, because here it is, the first, I guess, real pullback of, <laughs> no, of it's 2024. Not. We're, yeah, we're in a 2% drawdown. Can't you feel the pain? <laughs> the first real pullback. Are we even? I don't even think we are, dude. Uh, yeah, Let's we are. Say. We are. No, we're not. We're no, okay. we are not. Well, I don't know if what you're showing me is out of date. What is this? This is not, this is not, not only is this not out of date, this is in date. This is uh, live. It's are, been, are, so to Josh's are we, point, hold are on. We minus 1.98% from the Dude, high. it's literally at zero, it's 0.8%. 0 we are a whopping 0.8% below the all time closing high. So I, sorry, I have to correct you. This is not a correction. Chart back on. Well, I didn't say it's a correction. <laughs> No, Come you on. did. You said what? You said what are you going to do with cool the pullback? Off. I said cool off. Pullback. You said what are you going to do with the pullback? And I'm here to tell you, <laughs> sir, it ain't a pullback. So what we're looking at is this beautiful Yet. chart. This beautiful, delicious chart is showing that for 59 days, the S&P 500 has closed within two percent of an all-time high. Yeah, it's crazy. It's a hell of a streak going back to 1990. This is this is the 11th time. The 11th time we've had such a streak since 1990. So to me, mm. what that chart signals is that are we due for a pullback? Sure. Are we overdue? Eh, that's, that's subjective. But so if we overdue. do, if we do get a pullback, chill out. Chill out. Okay, fair. Uh, you might get the opportunity for that pullback this week. You have earnings starting at the end of the week. And you have March non-farm payroll. 
I actually don't think either of these is going to be a negative shock to the market. But what the hell do I know? Crazier things have happened. We're going to preview the uh, jobs report first. We don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but, you know, arguably, like, this is, like, a very critical data point uh, for the Fed and for sentiment around the, the forward pace of, of rate cuts, if, in fact, we're ever going to get one. Let's, let, let's take a look at this chart from Bloomberg very quickly. So this is the expectation for U.S. job growth. I think consensus is now 216,000 new jobs for the month of March. Um, here's Bank of America. The March jobs report on April 5th will be the main focus in the coming week. We expect an increase by 200,000 versus 275,000 in February. So that would be a little bit of a downshift if it hits the number, which of course it never does. One of the reasons we are calling for a slowdown in job growth is payrolls in the month of March have shown a tendency to be weak relative to February in recent years. So, I mean, maybe the consensus knows that and has adjusted accordingly. Maybe not. Um, I do but that's my the B of A view. That's just me. You like to do more hiring in February also? Totally. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a couple of interesting things in here to look for. Average hourly uh, earnings are going to be a big part of the story because that's got a direct feed into the inflation data. Um, expected to rise by 0.3% month over month or plus 4.1% year over year. Um, the quits rate and posted wage growth from Indeed point to a moderation in year-over-year -year rates for average hours worked. Uh, average weekly hours should increase a little bit. Um, let's put up this, uh, this next chart. So this is Bank of America. Again, this is their average hourly earnings year-over-year -year percentage change. So this is like the long term that they're showing you back to January of 2008. So you can clearly see we have been cooling off in um, average hourly earnings on a year-over-year -year basis, but the pace of that cooling off seems to have stalled. Correct. Am I reading that right? You yes. agree with that? No, it's trending in the right direction. Yes. And it, paradox, like why, why is this, why are we cheering this that we want lower real wage growth? Because this is a big component of what the Fed is focused on. 100%. All right, we have one more. This is the real average hourly earnings year-over-year -year percentage change. Bank of America notes that's up 1.1% in February uh, versus minus 1.2%, which was the pace last year. So again, yes, it's cooled off in real terms, in inflation-adjusted terms, but the pace of it cooling off has basically ground to a halt. And that's when, when they talk about sticky, that's like the textbook definition. Would you agree? Yeah, but wait, I don't know, Josh, I don't know that this, that this is cooled off. I mean, real wage growth was deeply negative for basically all of 22. So that I'm was part the, of the, the problem. Pa the, pace of, the pace of it is cooled off, not the actual number. A little bit. It's I'm, moderated. I'm trying to split hairs and talk about the rate versus like the, the actual number. But the, but, and the reason why is because this is the whole debate now is the first rate cut June. Uh, maybe now the hurdle is too high for, to do it in June. And if that's the case, it's because of charts like what we just went through. Uh, give me this Dan Greenhouse tweet. All right, so it's not a correction or a pullback. I'm being silly. Uh, but Dan you Greenhouse points <laughs> Dan Greenhouse points something interesting out. The SPX rally may be pausing. Let's put this in perspective. S&P 500 is up 27% off the October low. Only five rallies in modern history have been comparable. Early 75, which is after a wicked bear market. Mm -hmm. Late 1982 which is right after the greatest bull market in history started. Early 99, after the long-term capital mark, uh, blow up was resolved. Mid 2009 off the low, generational low, and summer 2020 off the COVID low. So like this last burst, that we, this last 27% rally is up there with five of the greatest rallies of our lifetime. I wasn't really aware of that, were you? Yeah, we did, a, cause we did a chart on this a couple months ago. The, the recent rally, is, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. It's and the fact, you can't even sustain, a, for goodness sakes, a 2% sell-off. And uh, given what, what the tenure has done over the last couple of weeks and the dollar, the resilience and the fact that Apple is acting like crap and Tesla is acting like crap, the resilience of the stock market is remarkable. And I'm not mad. Yeah. Uh, is this as good as it gets for the stock market? I think it is. Let, yeah, last about, week. How, 
It's about it's about how, how what could be, be better? better? What how could, be, could better? be better? Let me show you yeah. some shit. Uh, Ari Wald at Oppenheimer, one of our favorite technicians. His note this weekend was speculative themes emerging. And I thought this was a really timely note. And of course, it perfectly preceded what happened today, which was a lot of this stuff like started to give signs that it wants to reverse. This is Ari. Our bullish composite reached 91% last week, marking the most optimism in this contra indicator since 2018. However, it's difficult to become too downbeat on the market when speculative themes are emerging higher from three-year declines. These include microcaps, ARK Innovation, IPO Index, Meme Stock Index. So overall, consolidation would be reasonable, but is not necessary. With the market overbought in a confirmed bull cycle, we expect bottom-up selection to outperform top-down timing. So he's saying like, yeah, there's, there's like some emerging, uh, that, you know, there, there, there are some things emerging right now that haven't been part of the rally yet. And I'm going to show you some of this Wait, stuff. Hang on to that point, to that point. So the reason as good as it gets, this is a very slow grind higher. You're not seeing euphoric 1% up 2% up 3% days. We're not seeing that at all. It's a slow March higher. So the percentage of stocks <clears throat> at a 50 day high, Right, so that really shows like the, the enthusiasm. Their percentage of stock is at a 50-day high. Right now, it's 8%. It got as high as like 32% in the recent uh, run-up. But that is nowhere near. That's not stretched at all. At all. Okay. 30, yeah. So like earlier in the year, it was 60%. In 2020, when things were really nuts, it was 70%. So we are, it's a slow grind, which is good. You don't want things to be going crazy vertical. We're actually, and we're post that big bread thrust that we had been talking about in February. Correct. Like we're, we're, and we're hanging on to those gains. It's not, yeah. it's not the whole thing's not reversing. Um, put this next one up. This is Russell Microcaps. The top pain is absolute basis with the 200-day moving average. You could see that they are clearly breaking into uh, maybe a new uptrend. Relative to the S&P 500 is the bottom pain. And Ari Wald is showing that they are at least bottoming. I don't know about breaking out. But this is a multi-year downtrend that now looks to be resolving to the upside. Uh, one more. Here I'm showing you. This is also Ari's chart. Here is ARC. Basing. Potential breakout. Here is the Renaissance IPO index. Breakout point is now support. This one is already in a, in a, in a confirmed breakout. And the Roundhill meme stock index, um, which, as you can see, has completed the base maybe it's breaking out. I don't even know what's in that thing. So like the, these are these are areas of the market that have not been amongst the leadership group. They've been they've been left for dead. So I don't know. Like when you see that, Mike, is that closer to an end? Or is that like just the next phase of, of something that's sustainable? What do you think? I think it's a continuation. Okay. When you see the things that haven't participated start to participate, when everything is acting as well as it has. I mean, just look at the market today. It was down, I don't know, over 1% at, at the lows, finished at the, at the high, close at the highs of the day. The S&P down to 64 basis points. The market is remarkably resilient right now. It's not gonna be this way forever, but for right now, it's hard to, what's the bear case right this second? So micro caps, meme stocks, and ARC stocks turning higher is not like, oh, there we go. That's the so you don't you don't see it that way. I don't see it that way. And uh, Tesla obviously brought down Arc today. Yeah, disaster agreed. today. Agreed. Ex Tesla though, a lot of those stocks, uh, they're they're catching bids. It's interesting. I was looking at I was looking at a couple of them. Uh, I should I should take a closer look because I'm not even sure what's what's really in that. Uh, okay, let me show you this from Jeff. So Jeff DeGraff, also one of our favorite technicians, put this chart out last week. 90% advancers in the Russell 3000, which is, or, or in the S&P 500. What's an advancer? Is that just um, up on the day? Yeah. Like, yeah so, like so, so, I mean, this is same idea of what Ari's saying. Moment, sometimes like too much momentum, it might be too much in the short term, but it doesn't have to be the end of the rally. And Eric Boucher, who uh, blasts these out on behalf of Re uh, Re Renaissance Macro says, quote, Jeff has been flagging this excess high momentum chart for a few weeks now. Um, the call is names in quartile one are extended and should have a decent pullback. 
while names in quartile five could join the party. With 90% advancers, you're seeing it breadth. So uh, the, the important thing is extreme momentum is not bearish for the overall market. You have breadth expanding and uh, small caps starting to outpace large caps. This is the broadening, and it is not indicative of a top. Even if it's like short term, maybe a reason to calm down. Yeah. So I think that's a, f a fair way to phrase it. Um, uh, we go to much, anything else? Well, I guess, I guess what would what would make if so? If you're not worried about you know that level of extreme momentum, what would you, what would you be concerned with in terms of price here? Like, what do you not want to see? I don't want to see. I don't want to see stocks going vertical. They're not. It's a some, slow. Some, some some are, but most they're not all. Some it's are. a slow grind higher. What's even like Nvidia cooled off? That's not going vertical, is it? Not to, I don't no, know. It's, it's been it's been sideways for the last two weeks. So what I would like to see, not that I get to choose, is the S and P just correct for through time. Just go sideways for a couple of weeks. That'd be great. I don't want. I think, I think it'd be the, nice the, if the, we could all catch our breath. Yeah, like you want to see stocks going like this. The minute they start doing that. The market gets fragile and unstable, and that's not what's happening right now. They're they're not mooning. Uh, right. Well, my, I guess my point was they did, they did in February and a little bit in early March, and then rather than reversing, they just kind of started to calm down a little bit, and now you have these new stocks that are rallying, and the baton is being passed. It's strength okay. begets strength until it doesn't. I mean, that's not profound, but like as long as the market's going higher, what you know. Hard to, right, be, hard to be bearish. You're up. What do you got? All right. We'll talk on that, in that vein. Look, throw up this weekly chart of small caps. So uh, a rough session today. This is a weekly chart. But does this not look like a breakout in progress? This looks like a, re this looks like a test that's going to be successful. Do you see that? You see, two, yes. you see two, 200 as the ceiling. What is this, the Russell 2? Yeah. yeah. Uh, look at 200 on the IWM ETF. Look how many tests since, uh, since I guess, uh, the middle of, what, 22? So what JC would say is uh, resistance turned into support. If it gets back yeah. there, you buy the snot out of it. Uh, all right, Tom Lee. <laughs> buy the snot out of it. That's so small JC. Cap, small cap sales are, are faster growing than the S&P 500. That surprised me. So he's looking at the S&P 500 sales growth. Oh, this is for, this is for, this is going out a year. Okay, whatever. But either way. Projected to do 5.5% next year. Uh, that's for the S&P. The Russell 2000, the positive earners, are projected to do 6.9% sales growth, which is very nice. And then all of them are, are projected to do 7.4% sales growth. So okay. it's not just the te technicals are lining up, but fundamentals look good as well. And they're cheaper. Mm. Uh, small caps... Uh, the Russell 2000 is trading at 10 times earnings or projected for 2025, I should say, excuse me. Positive earnings are trading at a little bit higher, 13 times earnings versus 17 for the S&P 500. And then interestingly, interestingly, uh, nobody wants these pieces of garbage. This is from Bank of America. <laughs> the Russell 2000 stocks represent just 3% of active portfolios which oh is the God. half of the weight versus a decade ago. That's pretty remarkable. Wow. And listen, I understand. These things have underperformed for so long that there's career risk here. So these things are lining up pretty nicely. This is wild. So people are just like not even... It, uh, what does it take for people to get interested? Probably like two straight quarters of Russell outperformance well yeah, to the S&P. Maybe right? more. Yeah. Half a year and then, like, and then like Barron's puts it on the cover. And I do a, a TV sh segment about it, and then all of a sudden, everyone's like back into small caps. Is that how that yes. goes? Yeah, okay. that's exactly how it goes. You know, you know um, the playbook. Yeah, they'll st we'll start doing segments like pick your favorite small cap, or like, <laughs> like, like come to like come to school with your um, with your show and tell item. Like come come to the show with your favorite small cap name. You know what I mean? Like we'll we'll get there. Oh yeah, and uh, that'll. That'll probably be the time to stop. Uh, can we put that valuation slide back up? I think it's the middle one. Thanks, John. Small caps, 10 times earnings. I don't really care if that's forward or backward. No, we're, versus... go we're, going, out to we're going out to next year. Go All right, fine. So small caps is selling at 10 times 2025's numbers. And <clears throat> the S&P is 16.9. Really? I, th I thought it was higher. Okay, either way. Don't hold your breath for that valuation gap to close. It pretty much never does. 
True. So, right? So that's that shouldn't be your expectation. True. Um, is, is the point that I would make. So, uh, all right. I want to talk about oil and gas. Let's do crude first. This is West Texas uh, Intermediate Crude Oil Spot Price. Um, you can clearly see that we really haven't seen the kind of rally in crude prices that we saw back during the inflation era. Look at 2022, by the way. And I know that's coming off a crazy low base. But still, that was when inflation was like, I don't know, 9%, right around the time the crude was you know, over 105. And now it's here at a comfortable, lukewarm 77. Um, now let's take a look at the stocks, though. So you have some supply uh, issues. You have increasing demand because of the economy. This is IEO. These are this is an ETF comprised of U.S. Uh, exploration and production companies. Look at this breakout. This is like this is textbook. And maybe today got a little bit carried away, but whatever. Like I you saw wanna, this. Whoops. Yeah, you want to be in these names right now. Let's do the XLE. This looks even crazier. This is Exxon Chevron. And uh, and those types of names. I just brought up, looked at a chart of Exxon. I can't believe what I'm witnessing. Look at this, dude. These stocks are doing AI, but using oil. I, mm. I think. I don't know. Uh, let's do some individual names. I almost bought this today. Uh, I just feel like I missed it. This is Conoco Phillips, 130. Um, you've got a uh, you've got a 50 day at 114. 200 day around the same 115 and this is a stock that now wants to challenge the late 2022 high and I think she's going to punch through what do you think you just said the five most bullish words in all of investing what I think I missed it I definitely missed that's why it's going to 150 it's, it's going way higher here's Phillips 66 this is also in by the way Conoco Phillips is 18 percent of that IEO ETF so that's why I didn't buy it by the way so oh if you're asking me like why didn't Josh buy it because I also feel like I own it already because I do Phillips 66 PSX holy shit look at this stock look My at word. it I'm looking look at it and I'm, I'm I'm a liking don't just look at it buy it I can't it was one it was 140 it's 166 um you you're I think it was 130 at the start of the year Huge run. Everything there looks great. Here's MPC. This is Marathon Petroleum. No, you know what? This is the one. I'll Gone. Buy at, I'll buy this at 180. No, I won't. No, you won't because it won't get there. <laughs> 207. Goodbye. Here's uh, Diamondback Energy. Ticker is Fang. Get it? Because it's like a snake. 198. You'll never see this again, I guess. I don't know. I wish I... I wish I... So I, I have some exposure to this via the ETF. But again, like how, do I, how did I not see this happening? These are like obvious, obvious, obvious breakouts. So uh, this trade was on fire today. Everything else was flat to down, and these stocks were going absolutely nuts. I'm pretty sure I sold IEO at the lows in January. That's okay. It happens. What made you sell it? I was just getting rid of my losers. I was just. Do you remember when Nick Colas told us you never sell your oil stocks because that is your only true hedge against an oil price spike? that fucks up the rest of the stock market. Remember he taught us that? Warren Pies is a big energy stocks are the best diversifier guy too. They really are because they, they almost uniformly will do exactly what crude does. So if you get a situation where the market sells off because the dollar's ripping, inflation, oil, those are gonna be the thing that, that helps. And that's exactly how things played out today. Mm. And this isn't even an extreme move in oil. What do no. these stocks look like at 85 crude? A 90, like these things are going to be in fuego. So never sell your oil. Um, all right, you're up. There was an article uh, asking, hold on, I want to get this headline. Uh, there we go. A soft landing and is Powell the most successful Fed chief ever? Now, listen, this was obviously provocative, right? Like, get it. Got me. You got me. Uh, Joe Lavornia, chief economist at SMBC. Where, where did, was he at Deutsche Bank? Where was he? Yeah, he's been around. Joe Kudos to Powell. A long time. Kudos to Powell if he can achieve a soft landing. Vol Volker still heads the pantheon of central bankers, but Powell would eclipse Greenspan. And I completely disagree. Why? I s I'll tell you why. And I was going to say I don't know this. How I, feel. I was going to say this, but the great professor Jeremy Siegel said it better than I can. By the way, this guy is truly a goat among goats. I saw 
him being interviewed today by the head of the New York Fed, John Williams, who is a voting member, a powerful member of the FOMC. Jeremy Siegel <laughs> killed the Fed and then Hold turned on. to John. And, who was interviewing who? Siegel John Williams was, inter- was it. John, Siegel was being interviewed. Really? By a former he, Fed person? Not former, dude. The Fed chairman of the okay. of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Oh, and he he was oh, and he went after they're, Fed. They're obviously friends because yeah, Jeremy yeah, went yeah. on this tirade and then goes to John and said, "What do you think?" So, <laughs> so <laughs> it was that guy's the best. Um, yeah, yeah. It wasn't mean spirited. They're friends, but but here's what here's what Jeremy Siegel, Professor Siegel, had to say um, about the idea that Jay Powell nailed it, and I wrote this down. He said, giving Jay Powell the Nobel Prize would be like giving it to a drunk driver who hit a pedestrian but was able to take him to the hospital to save his life. Right. And I've, I've made this analogy that the Fed was driving 130 miles an hour. They slammed on the brakes and happened to not get into a car crash. They don't, I'm, I'm sorry. Powell does not get credit for this. The economy yeah. is bigger than him. He tried think, to bring it to its knees and he couldn't. Why does he get credit for that? In every, in pretty much every era, the Fed is always the firefighter and the arsonist. It's just they, yes. they create, they create the boom that leads to the bust. Then they come and ride to the rescue and save us from the bust, which inevitably plants the seeds for the next boom. This is just the way monetary policy. I don't want to say that that they do it on purpose, but they go too far in both directions. It's hard. It's like, it's really, really hard. They're trying to steer the economy like with, with a straight face. They're trying to control the actions of 7 billion people around so, the world. It's crazy. John Williams said exactly that because Professor Siegel said, I think one of the reasons they failed is they're using these inexcusably bad measures of inflation. And he's yeah. talking about owner's equivalent rent versus current measures. And John Williams said exactly what you just said. He's like, listen, we're trying to make sure that we get it right. We're trying to collect all of the evidence that we can. And of course they're going to say that it is a hard job. Listen, it it really is. But this idea that he now saved the economy, the economy thrived despite his best efforts to slow it down. So I am sorry. No, he does not get credit for uh, maybe achieving a soft landing. We did that, not him. Uh, Yeah, I think, I think with like, and the, if you're going to use anybody, I don't know, the greens, you want to hold up Greenspan as like the comp because, look, uh, Greenspan took over for, the, Fed, for uh, the prior Federal Reserve chief in the summer of 1987. And within like six weeks of his tenure starting, the first thing that happens is the crash of 87, which has absolutely nothing to do with Fed policy whatsoever. But he's the guy. He's in the seat. He has to figure out what to do. He immediately cuts rates all the way down. Like overnight, it, there's no meeting. Like he has to react to this disaster. It's a 22% sell-off in the in the Dow Jones in one day. So he slashes rates and leaves them there, and this miraculous thing happens. For the first time in American history, stock market crash does not spill over and cause a recession in the real economy. In fact, the economy is incredible, not only in 87, but also in 88, and Stock market closes positive that year. So what does Alan Greenspan learn from that experience? According to uh, my rabbi, Barry Ritholtz, the exact wrong lesson, which is no matter what happens, it's a nail and rate cuts are the hammer. And so every problem could be fixed with rate cuts. And that is the tenure of Alan Greenspan in a nutshell. Everything that happened, let's, let's take weights all the way down and leave them there. And he did it and did it and did it and did it until we got 1999. Because we had this thing in the market called the Greenspan put. And stock traders and investors and chief strategists and economists and banks, everybody got used to this idea. Don't worry, there's a put underneath the market because Greenspan's going to come in and bail us out. He did it when the ruble collapsed. He did it with the Thai bot. He did it with uh, Asian contagion and long-term capital blew up. And it, it's just this litany of things that Greenspan saved us with rate cuts. And then eventually, the, everyone just got too comfortable, took too much risk, 
And that's why we had one of the biggest crashes ever. And then, you know, of, of, of course, like Greenspan came out after the financial crisis and said, all right, maybe this doesn't always work. Um, so he's a bad, he's not the paragon of uh, FOMC responsibility. I don't think Powell is either, but I wouldn't even compare the two. But his term, he was wildly popular, at least in the beginning, but he turned into, he turned into the horse and the donkey, right? The yeah. horse in the beginning, the donkey in the end. Throw this chart up, John, please. So Gallup does a survey where they're asking, uh, do you have confidence in the Federal Reserve chair person to do the right thing for the U.S. economy? And look at this. Greenspan started super hot. And of course, the survey doesn't go back to the inception of his term, but he ended it on a sour note. And Mike, he, was, Mike he caused he caused the greatest housing collapse since the Great Depression. He single handedly took rates up. He did 17 straight rate hikes between 2003 and 2006. And even when mortgage hedge funds started to explode, literally explode, um, he persisted in ever higher rates. And he was watching the same dumbass indicators that they watch today. You know what he was worried about? Hilariously, uh, iron ore prices in the emerging markets. Like that, there was no justification for rates to have been as tight as they were in 07. None. Other than if you were looking at like commodity prices in Asia. And so he rode us right off the cliff. And, you know, again, he, he was the arsonist. And then Bernanke had to be the next firefighter because turns by then out, we were done with Greenspan. Turns out people don't like that, believe it or not. No. People don't like when you blow up the economy. How, anyway, I Powell, a, Powell was – go ahead. I have a solution. How about it's an algorithm and everyone shuts the fuck up and we don't have 12 people making speeches every 15 minutes about I'm thinking about rate cuts, I'm not thinking about them, I'm a little bit toward neutral. Like how about we just stop that whole game – and we just let the two year lead the way. And there's some sort of algorithm that factors in unemployment. And we use actual like AI and data to figure out prices. We don't yeah, call people happen. on the phone yeah. and ask them how much they could rent their attic out for to a crackhead. And we actually figure out what is shelter costs in the real economy in real time, not from six months ago. And what's employment? Why and what's the dollar? Catch, catching strays on this show. But you know what I mean? Like what? Like what? Are, what year is this that this is how we're capturing data? And why is there a man fiddling with the knobs like the shower is, is, is too, too cold or no, too hot? No, we need it. We need it. People what need, do we need? People need somebody to be controlling the ship. Yes, Even if but can, he, can they just pretend and use data? That's all I'm asking. They are using they data. What are you talking about? They're using no, data. They're, Come on. they're really not. They're using intuition and instinct. And it's that, that's, that, dude, that's horseshit. You might okay. not like the you might not like their conclusions, but they're not. I don't. Whoa, well, I'm. Dude, stop! I'm gonna give you one more chance to say that the Fed is not using their intuition and making shit up. They're looking of at. Of course data. they are. Of course okay. they are. Okay. The speeches, the speeches are the problem. The dot plot is the problem, because I agree. it's it, it's it's nonsensical, and they, it's not their fault. This is the job that they're there to do, and this is the job people have given them. They didn't invent this stuff, but like, and it and it and it it changes over time. You like a lot of people don't even understand this. There's no reason why there's a press conference after every rate decision. Bernanke started it during the financial crisis because it was essential to communicate with markets so we wouldn't have an echo panic. Mm. And rather than stopping it, they doubled down on it. Now it's like a now it's like a media event. Like I don't think it helps anybody this relentless focus on interest rates. There's no we, doubt. Who do we have on the show that was telling us in the 1980s they would just do the rate hike and then send a letter out two weeks later and let people was know it that Sembolist? they did it? Some, no, you're yeah, so, maybe. You're, you're so right. We're doing it because we started doing it. We just never stopped. I know because yeah. I remember a time when Greenspan spoke twice a year. They had Humphrey Hawkins' testimony in Congress, and he would answer the senator's questions, and then six months later he would answer to the House of Representatives, and then that was it. The speeches weren't even in English. He was speaking Martian. Look it up. Look it up. You couldn't listen to Greenspan speak for even five minutes and understand a single thing he was trying to communicate. It really is a and joke. And that was the point. 
Who's it for? You know, it's for hedge funds. It's for high frequency traders who immediately look at the statement, compare it to the old statement, see what words have been replaced, and they trade off that. That's who it's for. <laughs> I mean, I, I, agree. I guess. I don't, it's not helping anyone. Well, it's, so, no, it, it, employ, it employs a lot of reporters, to be fair. But I, the reporters are, the reporters have always been following this stuff, and they, like, they can do the job differently. There doesn't have to be 12 speeches. You know what I mean? Like I they can follow no, the data the same way the rest of us can. I agree. Anyway, I wish there were less talking and I wish there were less emphasis on rates and I wish there was less movement in general in both directions on rates. 0% seems extreme. 500 uh, basis point hikes seems extreme. All of it's extreme. And that's why we get these extreme outcomes. And it's unnecessary. It, like a lot of it feels very, very unnecessary. So that's that's all I want to say on that. Uh, Trump's Trump's publicly traded now, I guess. Uh, Trump did an IPO. I know this was a SPAC that merged with his Truth Social, and it's a new form of meme stock. So it's, it's the Wild West is back, but this is now like a politically oriented meme stock. So if you love Donald Trump, and your main concern is making sure he has enough money, um, you buy this thing. And eventually he'll sell the stock and he might be like, I think he has a net worth now of like $5 billion on paper because this thing is worth eight or 9 billion. Do I have any of these details right? Or am I just making this up? So William Cohen wrote a post on this today. I didn't, didn't get to read the whole thing, but his shares as of the writing were worth $5 billion. 5 billion. Yeah. He owns, Great. he owns 58% of the stock. <laughs> so the gist of the article. Chart again, on. I did not have a chance. Oh my gosh! Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty volatile. <laughs> which I did not have a chance to read was can he, can he sell some of the stock to finance uh, some of his campaign? Yeah, he will. What do you think he's not going to? Oh, somebody said. Oh, there's like rules against that. I almost fell off my chair laughing. What are you like? What What are you new to Earth? So that's that's look. At, the big story two weeks ago was oh now he's in trouble. They're going to confiscate his building. They're going to take away his golf course. No, they're not. It's another rabbit from, from the hat. He'll be fine. He'll sell a billion dollars worth of this thing, or he'll securitize it. And so whatever like money he has to pay to a court or whatever, it'll come from his fans. This is just another way that they can transfer money directly to him. And it has nothing to do with campaign finance. It's like a, it's like a workaround. So, so Cohen says, since he is deemed to be an affiliate, of the controlled company, and there's a lot of quotes in here. According to the merger perspective, Trump would be restricted to selling only a small amount of his stock, limited to the greater <laughs> of 1% of the total, whatever. So even, but even 1% is $87 million if the market would take it. And that's, that's not a lot. I know. The, 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 main, the mainstream media was running with the story last week that if he didn't come up with $400 million the next day, they were going to start padlocking all his shit. Nope. <laughs> not really. All right, so this stock... Went up is up 196 uh, percent year to date. It's up 267 percent over the last year. No, but wait, year. but wait, but wait, but wait, but it, but DJ, I'm looking at DJT. Is that is that the right ticker? Yeah. Didn't it, it just start almost, trading? No. It it was a spac before this. It was like DWA or something. It was Truth Social. It was it. This is a merger between Truth Social. And this publicly traded SPAC that bought it. They bought it. They converted it. The new ticker symbol is DJT. You, f you feel me? But didn't that just start trading a couple of days ago? Last week, no? No. It DJT. Was trading, it was trading as a SPAC until the merger, uh, right. until the merger closed. But I don't care about that. But it was trading as a, as a, as a whatever, as a shell company. There's nothing. It looked like no a SPAC. Assets. It looked like a SPAC. It was like a $12 price. Well, not that this, not that this matters at all for anything. But the company did... Five million in revenue and lost fifty million dollars last year. Oh no, four million in revenue. Oh, what are, what are you going to do? Analysis on this now? Yeah, I know it doesn't matter. I'm just saying. <laughs> do you think anyone pushing the buy oh, button? So Truth Social at made at, four million dollars in revenue. Price to sales revenue. Made four million in revenue during the nine months of 2023. And lost fifty million. It's not a bad business. Yeah, no, that should be worth nine billion. Yeah. Why wouldn't it? Okay, yeah, next. Why not? Uh, all right, this is interesting. So there was a great Substack uh, by a guy named Rob Wilson. 
It's called Consumer EQ. And I want to read what Rob wrote. Do you remember in May 2023 when Target CEO Brian Cornell called out the company's challenge with retail shrink? We spoke about this. He blamed organized retail crime for fueling $500 million or more in stolen and lost merchandise. Now, that was a big story. Yes. That sort of kind of disappeared. Yes. Well, I, did it disappear? The, the okay. what? Yeah, the organized retail theft. You don't hear about that. It just sort of came and went. Has organized retail theft become an issue for retailers? Absolutely. But what was left unsaid by Mr. Cornell's remarks almost a year ago was what may be just a significant driver of inventory shrink at Target and elsewhere, the recent rollout and increasing prevalence of self-checkout. So okay. this guy, Rob Wilson, pulled comments from uh, from some of the retailers. So here's Dollar General a couple weeks ago. We have begun immediately converting some or all self-checkout registers to assisted checkout options in approximately 9,000 stores. That's a lot of stores. This is intended to drive traffic, first hour staff registers with assisted checkout options available as second or third options to reduce lines during high volume times. Then he says it gets better. Over the first half of the year, we plan to completely remove self-checkout for more than 300 of our highest shrink stores. Why, Rob Wilson asks, quote, we believe, this is from Dollar General CEO, we believe these actions have the potential to have a material and positive impact on shrink as we move into the back half of the year and into 2025. That's wild. So what are we talking about here? When you go to a self-checkout, who's checking you? Oh, I have eight, I have uh, 10, op 10 items and I'm paying for eight. So they're basically doing away with this. Well, they should. Well, it's one of the stupidest things I've ever seen. If you go to any store with self-checkout as an option, um, pretty much there's almost always somebody that works there standing there watching you do it anyway. So maybe it's one cashier watching four people at the self-checkout. But out of the four people who are simultaneously checking themselves out, two of them need some sort of assistance. They yes. scan the item. You don't do it. I put it on the left or the right. Oops, yeah. I put it on the wrong side. Uh, how do I do a credit card? Wait, I push debit card. Wait, I need a receipt. Uh, wait, I need a bag and, and I put Dude, the wrong thing into, in the bag. It's you go into CVS and you can't buy NyQuil. You can't buy NyQuil. So then the one cashier has to come out from behind the counter, fix you. There's seven people in line. It's dumb. We need so people at the cash register. So but anyway, stupid. but it's just interesting that a big reason of shrinkage. Yeah, retail theft, is, it's, not a, it's not fake. It's a real thing. But it's checkouts. This is self checkout is a huge part of it. Yeah. So people are just getting away with stuff at the self checkout. I think that's half of the story, though. I do think retail theft rings are still a huge story. It's just that probably Target is not the the epicenter of that. It's probably more um, department stores because they're going on Meta Marketplace and, and eBay and they're selling like they're selling like very expensive stuff. So. It's probably uh, two different stories that we it's all three. kind of bundle There's into There's a third. One. There's a third one. Another part of the article was that uh, he said like more inventory goes out the back door than the front door, meaning a lot of this is also employee theft is a huge problem too. So that's a whole other thing. Uh, did you hear that Amazon said today they have decided to give up on their just walk out program? This is true. Um, Good for them. So this is what uh, customers could just walk out of the grocery store without a formal checkout process. Instead, they're switching to something called dash carts, where customers scan products as they toss them in their cart. So if you've ever been to one of these Amazon stores, and I, I think I have. There was, there was I've been one to on, one in an airport. Maybe I was with you. There was one on 42nd Street by Bryant Park. It, Chris, like I went in there with Chris. It was annoying. There was like a a pile up at the door because people felt weird walking out, you know, without ringing something up. I don't we, It's listen, it's not necessary. We had a major innovation. People don't know this. Do you know who invented the modern supermarket? Ben Franklin. Close. Uh, Piggly Wiggly. So there, there was this guy, Clarence Saunders in Alabama. And in the 1920s, he was the first person to have this realization. We don't need a clerk behind the counter, reaching for the items that you stand there in order. Let's put all the items on shelves, and then we'll have a clerk at the very end by the front door. And this is the invention of the supermarket. 
and he went public, and actually it was the Amazon.com of the 1920s. It was a stock that went up and up and up, and he opened hundreds of Piggly Wigglies across the South, and that was like a huge <clears throat> innovation because the way it used to be was everybody waits on one line, there's an old man wearing a vest and those sleeve roller-up things, <laughs> and he would like with a stick knock down a box of oatmeal for you, and then so, and what else would you like? That, like, that was how you bought groceries. And Clarence Saunders said, no, 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 fuck that. Put it on the shelves and let people pick their own stuff. And when they're done, they could go to the front and we have registers. That was enough innovation. It worked fine. We don't need more innovation to buy groceries. There's no, okay. there's, there's, nobody's being helped by this. Do you think that in 10 years, this sort of self, the checkout list stores will be back? I do. I think this is just too early. We weren't ready for it. In 10 years, the earth or will be years, an whatever. icy gray ball of dust. No, that's um, you. You will be yeah, an icy well, gray ball of dust. Well, for sure. For sure. Maybe, maybe before then. Okay. All right. Uh, Anything else? We, you're you're going to make the case tonight. I'm really excited for this. I'm going to make the case for a stock that I own, that I think my thesis was, listen, people don't stop money. eating pizza. You're making money in this thing, dude. People don't stop eating pizza. I'm up 35%, not to brag, no yeah. big deal. Um, all right, so the stock is Domino's. Uh, mm. that, this is when I bought it. Now, chart off, please, for a second. Josh, remember a couple of weeks ago, I whacked my losers. I sold like PayPal and Zoom. I'm like, I'm not just, I just don't want to, I don't want to, and I said, but there are times when I break my rules. There are times when I break my rules. I broke my rule with Domino's. I broke it again with Hershey. So I they're not buy, rules? They're not rules. They're soft <laughs> rules. I, they're guidelines? If I buy a stock that's down 50% and it's like a, a PayPal, I'm not sticking around. You know what I mean? Like, if I lose 8%, I'm gone. If I, I, like buy a stock, I like this rule, though. But if I buy a stock like Hershey down 50% or Domino's down 50%, if it falls another 15%, I'm buying more. So it's, there's a difference. If I have the opportunity to invest in a company like this, I'm doing it. All right. So with that said, uh, on their recent earnings call, Domino's provided long-term guidance, projecting over 7% annual global retail sales growth. You know it's the largest pizza store in the world? Yeah. Yeah. People like pizza, it turns out. All right. Chart, uh, let's do some charts, please. So the stock pulled forward a lot of growth. Next one. As did a lot of other companies during the pandemic. The comps became impossible. Wait, back up. Back up. Did you buy it? You, the red circle is where you bought it? That's where I bought it. Not to brag. Yeah, no big deal. Um... Next chart. So the stock got whacked, uh, rightfully so. The comps were impossible. Uh, and so the stock fell more than 50%. They're buying back a ton of shares. Next chart, mm. please. Very shareholder friendly. It's got like a f almost a 4% shareholder yield. This chart Between for people that are listening, this is the shares outstanding decreasing from 56 million down to 34 million between 2015 and 2024. So over a decade, Pretty aggressive they shrunk buyback. the float by like 40%, which is super meaningful because the earnings have less shares to be distributed amongst. So your well share, if you don't sell, then your share of the company's earnings grows substantially when a company is doing that. Very well said, Josh. And technically, the stock is acting phenomenally. Mm. Uh, there you go. And are you going to get a new high? Uh, I wait? think so. Do you think there'll be some? Uh, you think there'll be some traffic though uh, up at that five fifty level? Yeah, or yeah, to and think... that's and that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, it's not just uh, it's acting very well relative to its peer group. So this next chart is Domino's versus an ETF that owns a bunch of restaurants. John Chardon, please. Did I put that in there? I thought I did. Maybe I didn't. Uh, yeah. Last chart. Uh, all right, I guess we don't have it. But what I was showing is DPZ divided by a ticker EATS, and it's breaking out relative to that as well. So the fundamentals are lining up. Technically, it's lining up. The cheese is lining up. The topics, it's all lining up. So wait a minute. You, where, you, where did you buy this thing? 350 I bought it on June 15th after the gap, the first gap up. I bought it at like uh, 330 something like that. 330 Okay. It's it's approaching 500 and you would pull the trigger here you're making would the I case dominoes here? right here well that, i think make I, the case so i mean this is the best price that you're gonna get probably not but yeah you could buy it in the next week or two okay all right i like it we're gonna we, we will we will follow um i have a mystery chart for you before we get out of here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i don't think this one's gonna be very difficult this is i'm showing you a technical look yeah shout, yeah, shout yeah, out to y charts yeah, yeah. i left is the this price tesla, in. Is this tesla look at you 
Look at you. Don't need any clues. Um, this, I think this is the, one of the biggest stories in the storylines in the market right now. And it is just not getting that much attention. But the losses here are starting to become staggering. And not it's just rough. in an absolute terms. Because in real life, professionals aren't measured just in absolute terms. They're also measured in relative terms. In absolute terms, the stock is now in a 59% drawdown from its record high. Oof. But in relative terms, believe it or not, it's like so much worse. There's almost no large cap tech stock you could have been in where you wouldn't have made in this same time period 30 to 50%. Um, it's really rough. So, so we have uh, we have some more post reveal charts here, or just one. I don't know. I don't even know what we have anymore. I don't even know what I'm doing anymore, Mike. Um, look at this. This was 1.239 trillion dollar market cap. Now 525, and we have another one, John. I forgot. All right. So pay attention. You could see the low here is right at the end of 2022, and I think that low is probably tax law selling as that horrific year comes to a close. This is a stock that just absolutely crushed people in the bear market of 22. Totally understandable, of course. It, it prints that low, and then it has a nice rebound. So that's about 118 or so, rips back up to 250. Um, it's been selling off ever since. It's been going down for a full year now. And I think that that, I, I think that level is not 118, I think it's like 108 or 110. That level is in sight. Uh, you know, it's, it's not that far from 164 to 110. I don't wish that on, on the longs here. I'm not like rooting for that. I don't, I don't short stocks. I don't buy puts. I don't bet against people, um, and, and root for downside, but that is probably, uh, going to be a buying opportunity. Uh, like, I don't believe things were that horrendous, uh, at Tesla that that level wouldn't hold, but I'm afraid to buy this thing right now before it gets there because it just looks so much like a falling knife. What do you think? There's a, there's a big fat gap at 145 that looks like it's probably going to get filled. And Dan Ives called this an unmitigated disaster. He's still long-term bullish. Um, but I agree with you that at some point, uh, if you have a multi-horizon and all that sort of stuff, blah, 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 there's going to be a really, really nice buying opportunity. Dude, this, but thing, oh, this thing always recovers. Like one time in the future, it won't. But... It just always does. Uh, this is the proximate cause for the sell-off today. And again, it's been going down for what feels like forever. They reported last month's sales, and they were way worse than expected. They, they built 433,000 cars. They reported 387,000 sales. And that's down from the 484,000 cars they delivered in the last quarter of uh, 2023. This is a quarterly sales number for, for their vehicles, and it way fell short. Uh, I, I'm curious to, to see how the stock acts over the next few days. It did close at the highs of the day. If it doesn't take out today's lows, then maybe all the bad news is baked in, but I don't want to make that bet. We'll see. I didn't, put, I didn't make this chart, but I looked at short interest, and it is the highest it's been since 2020. So if you remember in 2019, there was just massive short interest in Tesla. It's like 25%, right? It was crazy. Yeah. And, you know, they all, got, they all got unwound, those guys. And I'm, maybe it's different people, or maybe it's the same people revenge trading it. But the amount of, not counting options, just looking at short interest in the stock. Uh, it's still that, nothing. It's 3%. It, it's nothing relative to 2019, but yeah. it's higher than it was last year, and it's climbing. That's all I'm yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. So, and, if, and, you know, with good, anytime there's a stock cut in half, in a bull market, it's going to attract, it's going to attract short interest. So I'm not surprised yeah, at all. Yeah. So all right, all right, we're going to follow that one as well. Hey everybody, did you know tomorrow is Wednesday, which means an all new edition of Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben, my personal favorite podcast. Well, it's true. <laughs> listen on your listen on the podcast app of your choice. Thursday, we have an all new Ask the Compound with Ben and Duncan. Friday, brand new Compound and Friends with Michael and myself. And Saturday, a new Jill on money. So keep it locked on the compound all week. And remember, Los Angeles tickets are now on sale. We can't wait to meet you. Thanks so much for watching, for listening. We'll see you soon. Have a great night.